Welcome to Football Today. It's September 18th, 2023. And it's Bobby Skinner, not with Chris Rose. He bailed. He's calling the Browns game tonight uh, on radio, Mr. Big Wig. So I got Robert Schmitz, which, by the way, I've had to get that name down better now that the you know the Giants have JMS, who covers the Bears and does some other NFL content, was with us for our draft. Rob, going to get right into it. And I hate to do this because it sounds homer, but I put number one. The Giants had a 21-point comeback. They were down 20 to 0, 60 to 0 deficit on the season. And it was like, this is bad. Like the Cardinals are the Cardinals are just an untalented team, like across the board. And even like positions where the, oh, they got Buda Baker. Buda Baker didn't play. You rewatch <laughs> this game. I, you know, have divin- dove into it a million times. What was like the biggest takeaway you had from this? So it sounds so corny to say resiliency, like to not use some scheme word or talk about a player. But Bobby, Arizona came out firing. I mean, I don't know what was quite wrong with the Giants offense, but on defense, it's not like Dexter Lawrence wasn't getting pressure. Josh Dobbs, who's been in that offense for what, maybe four weeks, is navigating the pocket well and throwing strikes on time to receivers that are right at their breaks. I mean, it was a tough week for the Giants, if only because you're looking at a game like that saying, oh, you've got to be kidding me. We're getting this showing from this guy. But to turn things around like they did at the second half, I mean, I you want the unbiased observer's perspective. It felt like Daniel Jones took the game over. He was doing it with his legs. He was doing it with his arm. Jalen Hyatt had two huge plays that jump-started the rest of the Giants offense. I don't know. I could keep going, but I know I've also seen you guys speculating, did Brian Dable take over the play calling? And there are some other stories there, but Overall, I can't help but feel like the Giants righted the ship just as they needed to. Had to be one and one after this game. Oh yeah, and there is still some issues. Obviously, you don't like again. This I said the Cardinals team was untalented. They should have the Giants should have never been in this situation. Mm-hmm. But what you saw from Daniel Jones, like you said, was just total command of the game. I mean, seventeen of twenty one in the second half, um, and a couple of those were throwaways. Two hundred sixty yards. Eight carries for fifty-eight yards, three three total touchdowns. I mean, they scored on every single drive. Throwing in points. the pocket, moving outside the pocket to throw, moving outside the pocket to run and pick up key first downs. I mean, really, he did it nearly every way you could ask a quarterback to do. It was and awesome. You, you mentioned Jalen Hyatt, right? And mm-hmm. I think that is the biggest difference from this year to last. And Darren Waller had a, a quietly good game. You know, he had six catches for 76 yards, but he just adds an element they flat out did not have, right? And the first play out of the half, they throw it to him on the post. They they put Waller and, and Slayton on one side of the field and said, hey, attack that safety because they're shading that safety to you guys. Attack him and occupy him because we know Hyatt's going to win on this post. And he does. You know, he catches the 31 yard and I think he just opens stuff underneath. Like, even DJ missed two throws to Darius Slayton where Darius Slayton one down the field like Darius Slayton could have had another 90 yards like this could mm-hmm. have been a 450 yard game for Daniel Jones instead of a 350 yard game um so I think Hyatt allows them to do that and Jones has always had good you know uh good rapport with Slayton that hey get get those right and then you can be cooking a little bit but it is the Cardinals and you mentioned Josh Dobbs and that was the most frustrating part is that they were letting Josh Dobbs stay on schedule. When it's like, man, Wink Martindale, you are known for being this blitzing master going after teams' heads. And they just kind of sat back and let Josh Dobbs do his thing. And they were able to run the ball well. And James Conner was playing well, make uh, breaking tackles and bouncing plays to the outside. Uh, that it was kind of insane to see Wink just sit back and let everything happen underneath. Well, we saw something in a game that we'll talk a little bit more about later. I won't spoil it, but it does feel like a lot of these blitz-heavy defensive coordinators are still kind of figuring out how they want to handle mobile quarterbacks, right? And it's not that Josh Dobbs is the most electric mobile quarterback in the league. It's really more, Bobby, it seems like if you don't think the guy can hurt you from the pocket, just drop seven. We'll live with whatever he does because what do we think? He's going to do anything? Well, Dobbs did. Right. He like given four down rushers and only Dexter Lawrence really able to create pressure. I mean, the only one. 
that's a separate conversation I think we could talk about later. But it, it felt like Dobbs was totally comfortable navigating zero or one rushers. And that's something that's obviously got to change for the Giants. But in the meantime, seeing your quarterback step up and be the reason you won a game is a pretty massive thing to get from a quarterback that just signed a deal like he did. Well, especially after that Dallas week one game, which was just the offensive line was just over it. Again, I mean, you've seen some bad offensive. I mean, we saw that Giants Bears performance in the 2021 <laughs> lives in infamy. And it was just, I've never seen an offensive line get overwhelmed like they did week one. And credit to them, they held up enough against, you know, a bad pass rush by uh, the Cardinals, but they didn't have Andrew Thomas. Ben Bredesen, their second, you know, best guy, uh, you know, went out, you know, starting, you know, they benched Mark Wilinski. So we're able to hold up there. Uh, but yeah, defensively, I have like very, like, as much as I'm enjoying this win, I'm dreading Thursday night football versus the 49ers because that's that's going to be rough. But that's um, why you needed the win if you're the Giants. I mean, not to step on what you're saying, but sometimes you've got the Chiefs next on the schedule. That's where the Bears are at right now. And it makes a week two win game or that much more important because if you're one and one and you fall to one and two, okay, whatever. If you're 0 and three, do you know only six teams since 1979 have made the playoffs? in the NFL when after falling 0-3, it's it's a tough rap coming back from that. It's why, again, by hook or by crook, Bobby, you're going to care more about how this Giants team looks in Week 14 than how they looked in Week 2. In Week 2, what matters is the result. But it's not the only game that happened on Sunday. I want to talk about the Chiefs and Jags because that, was, that seemed like an AFC rematch. The Jags are expected to take a step forward, Rob. We I said on this uh, podcast Friday with Chris Rose, I was like, what does Chris Jones look like coming back? Because I, I said, I think if Chris Jones looks like the same Chris Jones, the Chiefs win this game. If he kind of is not getting as many reps and a little slow coming back, then I think the Jags win this game. And it was from the first drive, Chris Jones is here. I mean, on that first drive, he had a third down sack. They pushed him out of field goal range. He had a fourth and five sack. They were lining him up all over the place, over the right tackle and stuff. And the Jags went three for 12 on third down, 0 for 2 on fourth down. And it was the Chiefs, despite scoring 17 points, held the Jags, who, you know, you expect big things out of this Jags offense, held yep. them to nine points. And it just shows, like, how much of a difference maker that guy is. And honestly, the Chiefs got to be kicking themselves a little bit because like they we'd be 2 and 0 if we had this guy in the in the lineup. I mean, easily. Like you're talking about Bobby, that is a different defense. I mean, you look at this Jags roster and they got guys that can play. Evan Ingram still got a step, obviously came from New York. Uh Calvin Ridley looks like a stud. Christian Kirk shows up when he needs to and Zay Jones made a wild catch last week and another really strong catch this week that just fell out of bounds. It's it's like you watch these receivers and you know these guys can play in Jacksonville, but you rush the quarterback, man, good things happen. And it's wild because I don't know how you felt, but on the other side of the ball, the Chiefs can't seem to get out of their own way. I've never seen an offense with a quarterback playing so well and the offense still performing so poorly. I mean, Patrick Mahomes is dodging guys in the pocket. He's putting balls right where receivers need them to. And all they can do is feature Kadarius Tony and a haggard group of other receivers that sure they got Travis Kelsey back on the knee injury, but he looked limited to me. What did you think? Yeah, I mean, he 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 didn't look like the same Kelsey, you know, so hopefully he gets back to that. And that's that's obviously the biggest thing for the Chiefs offense is if Travis Kelsey's fully healthy, you feel all right. But like you mentioned, it's not that these wide receivers that they're just not a good group. They are like contributing to turnovers, right? Right. Like even Richie James <laughs> on the punt return just misses it. You know, that's three points for the Jacks. Three of the, you know. A third of their points came off of that. And then Seriously. he complete, complete a pass to Justin Watson. He fumbles it. Yep. And luckily they got the ball right back because uh, the Jags turned it over after that. But, you know, coming out of that week one game, it's like, well, as long as the Chiefs just – receivers just drop the ball and their drops don't turn into direct right. points for the other <laughs> – but it, it happened It happened again. So it's that's where you have to – if you're a Chiefs fan – and, again, I've, I've said in here, the floor for the Chiefs is like the third team in the AFC, right? right? So it's not like the Chiefs aren't good, but your 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 standard is Super Bowl and being the best team in the NFL every single year. And I don't know if you can have that standard 
with this receiving group because you're going to face some no. deadly pass rush units and who have their secondary tied up. And you're going to need, like, you, it's again, it's going to be, Kelsey's going to have to be amazing and fully healthy for them to move forward and, and get to the, get another ring. It's only week two, Bobby. But like you're saying, I mean, can't echo it enough. It's one thing to have a poor receiver unit. Every every team has complained about poor receivers at some point, right, Bobby? But the, the receivers are open enough to get the ball. And then what they do with the ball is a net negative for the team. It is ridiculous watching what's happening here. And I know it's a little early to talk about it. But at some point, you got to think the Chiefs are thinking about a deadline deal, right? Like, I don't know if that's going to be just someone you can rely on. That's like, hey, when I do throw you, you're not going to drop it or fumble it or pop it up for the other team. And I'll tell you, Bobby, maybe this is a segue into the next game you want to talk about. But there's a certain team I can think of who's uh, got this receiver on the last year of his deal. And if the team doesn't pay Darnell Mooney, well, I know the Chiefs offensive coordinator has a very strong relationship with Darnell Mooney. And I'm not saying that I've heard Degum anything. When it comes to this, it's more that if the Bears continue to implode, maybe certain trading options start open up that, or opening up that aren't just Mike Evans and the other little more obvious ones, right? I, I can definitely see them doing that. I mean, they made a uh, you know a trade for Tony at the at the not at the deadline, but a week before the deadline last year. Last thing on this Jags Chiefs game, yes. One, I love watching the Chiefs defense put three stack linebackers out there consistently. Mm-hmm. And not because it's their scheme, because they have three fucking dudes like <laughs> Willie do. Gay, uh, Nick Bolton, and Leo Chanel. Like it, it has nothing to do with, oh, this is their scheme. No, it's like we got three dudes. And that was why it's like when they drafted Leo Chanel, it's like, oh, they already got two linebackers. I want to see Chanel go to a team he's going to play. <laughs> and then he went out there and played well. I thought Carl Aftis played well. Here's the thing, and this is something I've noticed about Lawrence. As he ascends and goes up to like, okay, what tier is this guy in? I Again, we're talking about high standards for guys, and Lawrence, there's got to be a high standard for him. I really worry about him under pressure. Like, you look at the splits of him being clean and under pressure, and I think it's the biggest dichotomy between guys in the NFL, right? Where it's like he's not the worst quarterback in the NFL under pressure, but the guys who are in his range – are just bad quarterbacks in general. But when he's kept clean, he's like the best right. in the NFL. And if there was one thing at Clemson that popped up, and it didn't happen a lot because he wasn't under pressure a lot there. It's like when he's under pressure, there's just misses and, and bad decisions, but they didn't have to pay for it because they were so much better than everyone. I just, as the Jags and send, that's just something that's like, that's the main thing I'm watching with this team. How can Lawrence get better under pressure? That being said, they almost had like three touchdowns where it right. was a beautifully played. Nobody like I think Lawrence might place the beautiful like have the the best accuracy when he is clean in the NFL. And they were just like one yard out of the end zone. Right. Which Lawrence has gotten a lot of touchdowns like that, where it's like, man, that I can't believe they dropped that in. Like you mentioned the Zay Jones one last week. And you see that even his rookie year, as bad as that was, he'd had those plays. Oh, yeah. But those those popped out. And to your exact point, Bobby, it's like football is so we can be so overcritical sometimes when a game doesn't go somebody's way. But say that two of those touchdowns get dry, or get caught. The Zay Jones one where he just barely fell out of the end zone this week and another one of the ones you mentioned. And suddenly the Jags may win the game. Right. Like football scoring system obviously rewards big plays in the end zone. And if you don't, you lose massive chunks off the scoreboard. And here we are talking about (laughs) Trevor Lawrence under pressure. I tend to think Lawrence will get better. We uh, let's revisit this in week 13, week 14, if only because year three is when we should see him comfortable enough in the offense that by the end of the year, he should have a better feel for what he can and can't do on routes to Calvin Ridley, on routes to Christian Kirk, uh, whether he or when he's in the pocket on a five step drop or something like that, whatever situation he's in he should have a better sense of what's going to work, what's not going to work. But if he's still crumbling under pressure, I mean, that's something you can't really do in the playoffs because every quarterback ends up under pressure eventually. And and I agree. And that's the thing I'm watching for. Like, Jags got a, they've got their floor has been raised because of Trevor Lawrence. But to raise their ceiling, that's like you mentioned, like week 13, does it, does it get bad? Does it get better week 13? That's the thing I'm watching for the Jags this year. Let's, let's talk about your Chicago Bears, uh. Rob. And I'm just going to ask you questions. <laughs> I went through some of the all 22 of week one, I didn't see much of yesterday. This was the offseason of Justin Fields, whether you loved him or hated him. 
what is going wrong over there? It feels like Justin Fields is being overcoached. And that's a two-way street, right? That's what are they telling him? How is he listening? Because instead of Bobby coming out as a dual threat quarterback, that's one of the most dangerous rushers in football, but also throws a really pretty deep ball. He came out and has nearly checked the ball down on just about every play. Certainly that's what the story was in week one, where he'd look downfield, pass on open receivers. I wish I was kidding. And, check the ball down at around the three second mark. And it looked like Bobby, he got feedback from his coaches. Hey, Justin, we can't be checking the ball down this often. You're flying through your reads too fast. You can't skip over some of this stuff. Drive the ball down the field. So what did he do in week two, in week two, Bobby? He sat in the pocket for upwards of four and a half seconds at times and took six sacks in 35 dropbacks. That includes the six sacks in the figure because I'm trying to be as nice as possible. That's almost a 15% sack percentage, and it's unacceptable. And it feels like he is taking, he's thinking too much. He doesn't feel natural. It In his time in Chicago, the Bears have changed his release twice. They have changed his footwork, and they've changed the way that he goes through his progressions compared to how he was not just at Ohio State, but how he did things in Matt Nagy's Bears offense. And I don't know, past a certain point, Bobby, I always sit here wondering with a young player, is he hearing too many voices? Like, are there, are, is the failure teaching the wrong things? And looking at these first two weeks, man, it's hard to not worry, right? Yeah, so I know the situation, right, where it's year three, different regime, and, like, there's promise there, and there's a lot of blame to go on Justin Fields, but you're also like, this coaching is not helping, right? No. And I, I agree with you, where they're like, I agree. Like I, wa- I, watched, I watched that week one game because I, I wanted to see Fields. I watched it live, and then I did a rewatch uh, for this podcast last week, and I'm like, man, Fields looks really bad, but also this coaching staff is not helping him, and that's no. par- and that's partly on Fields that he's in a spot in year three where he kind of needs help. But like I watch what the Packers are doing with Jordan Love, right? Where Jordan Love doesn't look spectacular right now, no. but the Packers are putting him in good spots to make plays and use his athleticism, and you just, to me, you're not seeing that consistently with Fields. Or it's like they operated they operate their offense like they have you know a best pure drop back quarterback in the NFL and even if Justin even if you really thought Justin Fields was going to be good you knew it wouldn't be like that you knew right. they weren't going to win by just dropping back you know progress the field like yeah you'd have you have to run that type of stuff but there's a lot of stuff you can do where there's moving them outside of the pocket and the you know the max protect play action two three man routes and i just didn't see that in week 1 and i don't know how much of that they did in week 2 And that's the really scary thing, Bobby, is on one hand, sure, you want to help your quarterback out. I mean, look at what the Eagles do with Jalen Hurts, right? Nearly every pass is a RPO. It's a play action pass. It's a roll. Like, it's not that he never drops back in the pocket. He does enough. But he's so supported by other pieces of the offense that the entire weight of the offense's success isn't on his ability to hit full field drop back breeds. You know what I'm saying? But within that, we get this we get this bizarre tape that is more exposing fields than it is helping fields. I wouldn't even say it's trying to hide fields. But at the same time, Bobby, it's hard for me as an analyst to look at a player who's got open receivers and decent protection often enough and not say, OK, why aren't we hitting that? Like past a certain point, you do have to hit a strike from the pocket. I mean, Daniel Jones, you just brought him up and your experience there. Here he is in what is it? Year five now. And he is he's firing strikes over the middle to tight window or tight window players while under pressure. Like you eventually have to hit that big throw from the pocket on fourth and eight or third and 15, because that's just the state of things in the NFL. So I honestly sit here pretty bewildered. I think Fields' talent is obvious, but every time I hear Bears fans say, oh, we should just roll him out more, use more play action, it always brings up echoes of exactly what people said about Mitch Trubisky. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and it's... So, like, here's where I say... How Is he making the same plays with his legs that he was last year, or is that kind of stuff... It feels like it's dried up as if the player spent an entire offseason hearing from everybody that he was a running back, not a quarterback, and said, I'll show you 
I'll prove it to everybody that I am a thrower. So I have no idea. To your point, is it the coaching that told him don't scramble anymore? Or is it that he finally trusts his receivers enough to want to throw the ball, but not enough to throw it on time? Therefore, you get more of these sacks instead of the 59 yards of scrambles that you even got last week. Honestly, Bobby, not only do we need the all 22 because we do, but I don't know. We probably need more weeks to figure out which how much blame is on who. But even then, man, it's it's a gross game. Felt like a game that Chicago should have won, though Tampa did a lot of things relatively well. And that leads into the next topic, Rob. To the NFC South, the worst division in the NFL. Well, we got the <laughs> Saints, you know, maybe going to go 2-0 and playing the, you know, the, the Panthers later tonight. And you have the Falcons and the Bucks who are both 2-0. Which 2-0 and team is better, the Falcons or the Bucks? Man. Okay, so I was just watching some Falcons this morning as we were prepping for this, and I can't help but think, Bobby, that this comes down to do you like offense or do you like defense more? Because the Falcons' offensive pieces are real. Is B. John Robinson fun? B. John Robinson is the best NFL running back in the NFL. <laughs> He's, He's the, I'm, I'm, ser- I'm not exaggerating. He's second in rushing on a team – that is splitting the carries between the two guys. Right. And I don't even hate that they're splitting because Algier is, does his job really damn well. Seriously. I, the way Bijan's able to make guys miss while staying in the structure of the run, which means we're not like juking this guy out of his shoes, but now right. the linebackers have, have pursued and they're there. We're not bouncing plays and reversing them and putting together highlight plays. No, we are running wide zone. And if a dude gets in the backfield, I'm doing the most subtle of jukes to get your ass off me. And then the speed at which he hits the hole, and then you add the receiving element. I am not exaggerating. And I, you know, I'm, you know me, Robert, I'm kind of sometimes late to the party because I'm, I don't <laughs> like to anoint things right off the bat. I get you. Bijan running back, Bijan running back, Bijan Robinson to me is my favorite player in the NFL right now. Oh, I mean, and it he, makes me love the Atlanta. Fal- I think he's the best running back in the NFL. I really, I really, really do. And it's so funny because then I'm going to come right behind you and not just talk about Bijan. I think Drake London rules. He's one of the better contested catch guys that I've seen just in the way that he will use his body to box guys out and take balls that a DB should have a shot at and take that shot away. And so he'll just clean up a 13 yard curl or a slant that the, or where the ball hits him in the body and he'll take care of it. Hit Kyle Pitts is obviously awesome. Can't help feeling like Bobby. What holds this t- Falcons offense back is their quarterback. But as soon as I start thinking about that, I take a look at the death chart. Taylor Heineke's on this team. Like if Desmond Ritter doesn't get better, there's a floor here. You know what I'm saying? I'm so glad that you brought this up. Because I don't know if you've been listening to the show or keeping up with the John Boy socials. I have been in on this. Like, I think that they need to put Heineke in, right? And <laughs> Ritter won this game. And Ritter made some plays. He was a lot better he definitely this did. week than he was last week, right? Where, And where, what I mean by that is they were able to complete a pass past the line of scrimmage. But, but to me, it was, Bobby... still, it was still ugly from Ritter, though, man. He man, was three he... for eight on passes over 10 yards with an in, uh, ugly interception. There were two plays where Quay Walker and Jair Alexander had passes yes. put directly yes. in their chest, and they dropped them. I mean, he and the Jair one's a pick six. The, yeah. the Jair one may have iced the game immediately. Yeah, I it, mean, it, bad. seriously, and they won this game by one point. I love this Falcons team. I think they're winning the division. The one big play that they, uh, you know, had was a deep throw on a flea flicker that was underthrown by Ritter. Um, you know, on their two field goal drives to end the game. He completed four passes. You know, you had a third and seven throw behind on on a slant route, which is like you can't throw the ball behind on a slant route, right? Like that. Um, now, what I will say, what he did do is he, I thought he used his legs very well, right? Getting yes. outside the pocket and not letting, uh, you know, uh, avoiding sacks. He had the rushing touchdown, obviously, but really, this was there was a couple, like you mentioned, Drake London. There was two passes to him on that dagger concept in the beginning of the game. And then on that out route uh, at the end of the game on that on one of those last drives, but to me, man, like the fa- I love the Falcons. They're my favorite team to watch. But it's it's I'm I, it's like I love you, but I want more for you type of relationship. <laughs> And I mean, seriously, best news possible for this Falcons team is that if 
Ritter isn't the dude by week seven. They've got a viable option they can turn to that'll be fresh at that point in the season. And to talk a little bit about the Buccaneers, their defense is legit. I think what Todd Bowles does on the back end, and especially given that they were able to handle the Bears like they did without Carlton Davis and a couple other guys on their team, like they they don't have Kalaji Kansi. For instance, at the moment, when he comes back, that defensive line that's already got juice is going to get that much nastier. But at the end of the day, Bobby, this offense in Tampa Bay is a question of how far can Mike Evans and Chris Godwin take you? Baker Mayfield looks like a requisite NFL quarterback. Props to him. Like he, especially against Chicago, balled. But that doesn't mean that he... (laughs) Balling against Minnesota's defense, who's got nearly no talent. Balling against Chicago's defense that, I'm not kidding, Bobby, might be the worst defense in the NFL. I don't know if that gets you the trophy that you think it does, right? Whereas with the Falcons, there's a plan here. There's a real plan to win major games. And I can't help thinking that they can go further than Tampa can. I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I truly think Bijan is the best back in the NFL, and I, and I, I don't hate that they split carries. But I think Algier, the way he's able to run through contact, is just really something beautiful. I mean, they're they're the number four rushing team in the NFL. I think by the end of the season, they'll be number one. Um, also Arthur Smith ballsy call on that yes. fourth and inches at the two minute mark. Awesome, like, like gotta do stuff. it. Gotta um, do it. I want to say you mentioned the Vikings defense, and I know this isn't on the topics. On that Thursday night football game, I had to be like, am I stupid right now? Or <laughs> are the Vikings running a college 3-3-5 three, three, where they have three safeties deep and it's like you kind of have like that joker middle safety playing deep. And I'm like, why aren't the Eagles just run- handing the ball off? And finally they did and had like one of the best rushing performances in oh, NFL yeah. history in like the – in the 21st century. I couldn't they just cruised. That. I mean, kudos to Brian Flores for trying new things. I mean, that's what I wish Matt Eberflus would do, just to use an example, because there's too many defensive coordinators. I feel like you've seen this enough, Bobby, where you know that the team is missing core pieces to run a defensive scheme, and yet we run it anyways, right? And it that makes sense in theory, because that's what you practice in camp, but in practice, it gets you, it just gets you smoked in real games. And so credit to Flores for trying a bunch of stuff. Like he obviously uses a lot of cover zero plus that three, three, five look that you saw, but the Vikings defense, man, like they got to figure something out because they are, they are rough back there. <laughs> it was like, it was, I was like, I was like, Oh, this is the defense Clemson runs with Isaiah Simmons. Yes. Like I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, last topic. We have two Monday night football games, which is a little chaotic. We've got uh Panthers, Saints and Steelers Browns. Which one are you looking forward to watching more? I actually really want to see the Saints. I mean, I thought so. I ended up spending a bunch of time because of Justin Fields watching quarterback dropbacks because part of me thinks that Fields' drop might be part of the problem. That's a whole separate discussion, Bobby. But within that, as I watched Derek Carr, the guy kind of balled last week. And so I sat there watching that game going, hang on. Is what Pete Carmichael and what Derek Carr are cooking up in in New Orleans with Chris Olave, Michael Thomas, and a couple other weapons, eventually Alvin Kamara when he comes off his suspension. Like, is this real? And then the Titans, who the Saints defense had made look so, so bad. They went out and beat the Chargers, who are yeah, not the a Chargers bad team. Are, you got to be panicked if you're a Chargers fan. Got to be worried. But as a Saints fan, this could be a blowout. But I'm not a Saints fan. But like, as a, if you're a Saints fan, this could be a way better team than I think anybody gave them credit for. But that's just what I see. What about you? Yeah, I, I would that Titans Saints game was so ugly. But I, I think I think Carr will kind of figure some stuff out. I, like you mentioned, if Thomas is is still good and I love Olave, just stay healthy for the love of God. I, I really do like him. Um, but I but I'm looking more forward to the Steelers Browns game. One, can Deshaun Watson had the rain all last week? No rain this week, at least I don't think so. Can you can you operate? Can you operate? But I think that Browns defense, and I don't know if you saw Vast did a video on what oh Jim gosh. Schwartz was doing. And it was like, oh, gosh. And w- two of the more underrated moves of the offseason was the Browns bringing in Zadarius Smith and Dalvin Tomlinson. Like, I don't yes. know why no one talked about Like, Zadarius Smith is still sick. Dalvin Tomlinson is still really good. And that yep. defensive front could not stop the run. Well, now they're going to be able to stop the run. And you add those guys with Miles Garrett as pass rushers. They're going to be able to do some nasty things with Jim Schwartz. Um and the Steelers were my team where I'm like, I think they could be good this year. And I immediately got off that after two drives. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember Kenny Pickett doesn't deal with pressure well. And he's going to be facing a ton of pressure this season. Uh, um, 
So I I think the Browns might it might be a bloodbath versus that that Steelers offense. But I'm interested to see if the Steelers can bounce back. It um, does kind of feel like two showcases, right? Where New Orleans should have a pretty hefty talent advantage over Carolina. The Browns should have a pretty hefty talent advantage over Pittsburgh. So I guess it's whichever flavor of team you want to watch for, right? Yeah. Robert, you uh, you cover the Chicago Bears. You do some mm-hmm. other NFL stuff. Where can oh, people yeah. find your work? One, I appreciate you jumping on. You know, we've Anytime. probably done probably 20 shows together now over I love the it, years. Man. I, mean, I love it. If if you are if you don't know because a lot of people this is a new show. Me and Robert linked up when we both had like less than two hundred followers on social media. So mm-hmm. five years later, it's kind of cool to still be doing work together. Where can people find your work? If you like the Bears, follow me over at the Bears blog. And if you like more full NFL content, my YouTube channel Robert Schmitz, just my name, uh, is pretty fresh at this point. And Twitter under er, is at Robert K Schmitz. But follow me wherever. DM me if you want. And let's just I'm talk put the ball. link for your channel in in the in the description. Thank you. Really appreciate that. All right, that's football today. We'll be back Friday with Rose, unless we have to do an emergency podcast. Um, which I almost want to just start doing. Uh, Thank you, Mikey, for producing. We will see you guys then. Football today. I don't have the outro for this show. Thank you. Bye.